Hi, this is Mark with safedaytrading.org. And if you'd like to get free information on how to safely trade day trading activities, stop in and get free information at safedaytrading.org. Again, that's safedaytrading.org. Today with me I have Dave Keller, who is the Chief Marketing Strategist for StockCharts.com. Hey, Dave, how are you? I'm good, Mark. It's good to chat with you again. It is. Um, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, talk with me. So, Dave, let's uh, first of all let's give the listeners an idea of where you're coming from. Um, you know, what, how did you start out, and how did you get into being the chief marketing strategist? Sure. So I've been in the uh, financial industry for almost 21 years. I actually started in June of 2000. And so if you know your market history, my introduction to investing was seeing the unwind of the late 90s technology bubble uh, and then very quickly into 9-11 and uh, all sorts of, uh, of challenging experiences. So I learned the technical analysis toolkit, which is what my career has been built around uh, in those formative years. So I've, I've often thought of charts as a way to manage risk, not just to identify opportunities, which it's certainly good for, but it's it's a lot for me, a lot more about managing risk than uh, you know managing return potential, uh, and so thinking about potential downside and lines in the sand and how to manage uh, things has always been sort of central to me. Um, you know, at StockCharts.com, I'm the chief market strategist, and my goal is to help investors make better decisions. With my own firm called Market Misbehavior, I always um, I try to tagline, uh, feel better about making better decisions. <laughs> and so for me, it's, you know, I think it's two sets of things. Number one, it's having a toolkit that helps you analyze the markets effectively. And for me, my toolkit was developed uh, my time at Bloomberg in the early 2000s, mid-2000s working with a lot of institutional investors in, around North and South America. Uh, and then I went up to Fidelity in Boston, and I ran the technical research team there for about uh, eight and a half years, where we would uh, you know, work with all the equity mutual fund managers and help them figure out what stocks to buy or sell on any given day based on the overall trends. So part of what I do is help people analyze the markets more effectively. The whole other part, which I would argue is the much more challenging part, is actually doing what the charts are telling you to do. And I find the way that you approach your process in terms of your mindset, your routines, the resources uh, that you have around you to, to make better decisions, I think those are just as important as the tools and the charts and the you know, computers and everything that you're using. So my work has really evolved to focus on those things, helping people make better decisions about the markets and also uh, you know, having a proper mindset and setting themselves up for success. Okay. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about, or one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was your perspective on the uh, short squeeze activity that was going on at the beginning of this year with GameStop and the MC and gold, or silver. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that, Dave? I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating how what we've seen in the last couple months in some ways is very new. It's novel in terms of the ability of individual investors to have such a dramatic impact on, on the broad markets and, uh, and, and, of course, on particular names. And you saw the, the exponential rise on GameStop and AMC and, and, and a handful of others that, that went vertical very quickly. So, so I think in, in some ways it is, it is new in that it, it demonstrates the power of social media. It demonstrates how a group of investors uh, with individually with relatively little power can bind together and have a huge influence, and I think that is something that we're all going to be sort of trying to figure out how to deal with uh, for, for long long after now. But I think the other part of it is it, but besides just being new, I think it also in some ways is not new at all. Um, short squeezes, the idea of investors getting caught on the short side and having to cover or buy protection or do something to unwind that short position, that's not new. That's been around for quite a while. Um, and, and so I think the dynamics of what happened in this particular uh, instance are unique in that it really brought a lot of individual investors into a scenario that uh, that has played out in the markets before. It also demonstrates, I think, just the, the dangers inherent in margin trading, in short trading. And again, those are all reasonable risks, but they're risks that people should appreciate. I think the third thing I would mention then is in terms of the, the unwind. So you saw GameStop go vertical and then just as quickly 
come back down and, and lose, you know, 90% of its value very quickly. Uh, and now it's sort of chopped around since then. And I think, you know, there, it's worth remembering that in any sort of bubble, there's plenty of money to be made on the left side of the bubble. And when, you know, stocks or cryptocurrencies or whatever really start to accelerate, there's, there's plenty of money to be made following, you know, identifying those breakouts and following those breakouts. But you also need to make sure that you have a proper awareness of the risk uh, the risk along with the return potential. And I think that's where a lot of people probably got caught, you know, holding the bag on the right side of a bubble because when a bubble unwinds, it doesn't tend to just gently, you know, alleviate the pressure and slowly roll over. It tends to come down just as quickly as it went up. And that's, again, for hundreds of years, we've tracked bubbles and how they uh, accelerate and how they, uh, how they come off. So I think in some ways that – whole experience with Game, GameStop was sort of a microcosm. It was sort of a, a brief example of how a bubble can actually play out in, in a very short term. Yeah, well, you know, as a scalper myself, I, I like that kind of a situation because I can play the left and the, and the right side of it, you know, just equally as easy. And like you say, too, I mean, um, stocks or any financial instrument goes down 66% faster than it goes up. Um, so you I mean you're really look, you're really looking at a crash when it happens, which yeah. for me is a, for me is you know okay. So I've got two questions <laughs> for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, but a lot of people have that. You know, like we talked before, they have that buy and hold mentality, and that just doesn't happen anymore. I don't think. But I have two questions. You know, and, for and you. I think the, the other thing to remember there's a, there's a, um, uh, a, a a behavioral bias called the recency bias, a recency effect, and and what that is is basically whatever just happened, you assume that that's going to happen in perpetuity, that that's just going to keep going. And what happens as a stock rises exponentially, and if you get in there and you buy it and it starts to go up, you start thinking. Not just, wow, I'm going to have a nice 10%, 20% gain. You're at some level, either consciously or subconsciously, thinking, I'm going to retire on this one trade. I'm going to be able to buy a new boat, a new house. You know, whatever. Like you start thinking what's going to happen if this continues on forever, and, it, and, and nothing continues on forever like that. There is a point at which it's over and, and things unwind, and I think – uh, you know, what, what I would hope is that people learn from these kind of experiences to understand that there are risks on both sides of it. But as you, as you hit on, there are opportunities as well. I, one of my mentors, Charlie Kirkpatrick, who wrote one of the best books on technical analysis, um, uh, he, you know, he basically said that volatility equals opportunity, right? As a, as a technically yep. oriented investor, as a trader, as a scalper, um, the more volatility, the better. The worst market is one where there's just not much movement because then there's not really any opportunity to differentiate and to anticipate swings and, and get the movement. The more volatility, the better. And I, I don't think we're going to see volatility going down anytime soon. No, no. Well, I mean, commodities today for about an hour or so, hour and a half, were in a narrow range. And for me, that's I don't like trading that because, you know, you can't really have the opportunity to do anything. But I have two other questions for you. One is the impact of retail uh, traders now. Do you think that's going to become more and more significant? I, I mean, I certainly don't see that going away. Um, I, you know, I think the, the market is always evolving, and I think once this sort of thing has happened where you've seen – you know, um, you know, some big institutions caught on the short side and having to feel the impact of what happened. That only works as long as you have a stock like GameStop with a huge, you know, huge short interest that is very vulnerable. And you saw that soon after a similar sort of pattern was, was really attempted with silver prices, but you didn't have the overwhelming short institutions like you did with GameStop, so it didn't really play out that well, right? Silver so didn't really you know, bounce, it didn't really accelerate the way that some of these other stocks did. So I don't, th I don't see a lot of other examples right now s exactly like what we saw with GameStop and, and AMC and others. Uh, so in the short term, I don't think we're going to see another one exactly like that. If you're talking about the impact of individual investors, I certainly see that increasing. I don't think that's going to go away. And I think, you know, when you think of the um, you know, the, the ease with which we can, as individuals, access the markets with you know, zero commissions with limited, you know, again, it's, it's cheaper now to trade stocks, arguably, than it ever has been. So I think the barriers to entry are still 
uh, are still very low. So I, I don't think I don't see that necessarily um, uh, going away. I, I think what you know what concerns me about it, though, as is, is always, is when you have an influx of new participants in the market that are relatively inexperienced. They haven't had their really painful experiences that you probably have, formative experiences in your trading career, so, you know, painful ones that I've had. Like any, any successful trader, successful investor can tell you their war stories from early on in the career when they completely missed something or were caught on the wrong side of things. And I think you have a lot of new investors that have not had those experiences yet, and I'm afraid they're going to start having them if they haven't already in, uh, in 2021. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, like you say, I, I you know, we – Refilling the, the account several times. You know, I, I think I refilled my account three times in the first two years. And I, you know, I'm sure you probably did the same thing. So, yeah, so I mean, that's the that's the tuition. I think as a as a trader, yeah. most people talk about you. You know, as an alternative to an MBA, your tuition is painful trading lessons early in your experience, and that's again, that's how you earn the right. That's how you earn the ability to do this you know, over a long period of time, which, again, you and others have successfully done. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really, it's really, I, you know, I, the, like I say, the war stories can really be spread. But the second question I have for you, and this is kind of a little bit more concerning for me, is the actions of Robin Hood um, during this whole incident. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so that was a big focus of the congressional hearings, uh, right? Last week was focusing on just yeah, how yeah. all the different players were involved in that. And, that, you know, I think there, I, I think you know, the reality is with, you know, the fact that there are zero commissions, and, and a lot of times it's phrased as commission-free, um, you know, we often hear the word free, and psycholog there's a reason why they say commission-free, because psychologically, from a, you know, if you go to any marketing class, they will tell you that word, immediately your brain treats that in a certain way because they see it as you're getting something for free. That's why you have a free trial, and, and uh, you know, that's something that we love to get, get behind as, as consumers. So when you hear commission-free, you think free, but it's not. It's just no commissions. They're, you're still paying for your ability to trade it because the broker is providing a service, and it's, it's in other forms. So it's things like order flow and the spread between the, you know, where they would buy and sell and, and all that. So there are still ways that a broker is able to make money with it. The challenge I think we have now is a lot of those costs are not as transparent. It's hard to get a, an exact feel for how much you're actually paying to trade. Um, and, and so commissions were one very transparent way. You knew it costs $15 to make this trade, and you kind of knew that was it. Now it's it's a uh, it's a little more uh, it's a little less transparent. So you know what Robin had had to do that was basically based on I mean as far as my understanding, um, you know a, a broker like Robinhood is trying to um, you know accommodate their their uh, their users or their their clients trying to take certain actions, but also all the regulatory requirements they have for you know maintaining a certain amount of capital, and it it, it you know it, it resulted in this uh, in this challenging situation where people. We're trying to do something and they weren't able to. I, I think what you'll find is I, I would not be surprised if you see some additional regulations come out to try to address that. And I think the general ways that they will try to do it is, you know, you want to empower individuals to be able to do what they want when they want. But at the same time, you know, you, you also need to make sure that the financial system remains as stable as possible, which means brokerages need to, you know, need to make sure that they're able to cover all the things that their customers are able to do. I don't think there's an easy answer for that, but I certainly think that's what, um, you know, uh, many will be trying to focus on in the coming months and, and honestly, the coming years. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, this kind of reminds me of the, the, the um, high-tech bubble burst. Um, in 2000, was it 2001 or 1999 or whatever it was, you know, yeah. and the reaction, um, the actions both of the traders and of the government in terms of what they try to do because, you know, you've probably heard the stories about people jumping out of, uh, you know, out of windows and, you know, making bad decisions and all of a sudden in total financial ruin and that stuff, so. That's what kind of this feels like, but you know, again, that was a long time ago. Well, you know, and, it, and it's funny. There's a book. Um, uh, it's by uh, Maggie Mahar. I think her last name is M A H A R, and it's just titled "Bull: uh, A History of the Boom and Bust 
1982 to 2002 or something like that. But it basically chronicles that bull market phase from 1982 to 2000, and then the unwind of there, the explosion, the popping of the tech bubble from 2000 to 2004. And I will tell you, if you get that book and read the conditions in terms of what the late 90s were like in terms of how people were, you know, uh, mentally, emotionally thinking about stock investing, all the new participants, the, you know, I've, I've described the environment recently as frothy, and there's so many, you, you will read that book describing 1999, and you will think you're, you're reading a book about the current market in terms of valuations and how we've gotten to here. And I think it would be really instructive to read about 2000, 2001, and see how those things actually unwound, because, uh, again, the, the tech bubble had a left side and it had a right side. And, and while that not, might not exactly happen, you know, the market doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes, and I think we'll have some rhyming to what we saw on the right side of that, uh, that bubble. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would argue that we're looking at a, a repeat of history again, but, you know, uh, it's, it's just a small thing. So what are your let's, – let's shift away from that a little bit, and we've got about five minutes or so. Um, could you share a little bit about what your thoughts are for 2021, if you can? Yeah, of course. So, you know, when I think of, uh, you know, the last year, and, and we're, you know, hitting the one-year anniversary of the, uh, of the, of the market peak in February uh, of 2020, if you think about what we've learned in the last year, you know, it was a severe sell-off that took one month. It was a recovery that took, you know, a number of months to, you know, to, to uh, almost a year, depending on what stock, what sector you look at, to regain that high that we had in February of, or January of 2020. Uh, and I think if you look at the last year, I think there are a lot of similarities to 2009. And if you think about it, in 2009, you had a, you know, you came off of the 2007 high. You rolled really heavily down into the low in the first quarter of 2009. Uh, and then from there, the rest of 2009 was actually pretty positive. You, you, you came out of that V bottom beautifully. And it was led by things like banks and others early on, and then everything else sort of caught up with it. And then you had 2010. And I think if you want – if you want an idea of how I would see 2021 playing out, I think it's going to be, it could be very similar to what we saw in 2010. 2010 overall finished stronger than it started. So if you look at December 2009 to December 2010, you finished overall, the, the market you know, appreciated over that time, but it was a very rocky road. During the year, you had a couple pullbacks with you know, severe swing lows. You actually made a low in the first quarter and then made a lower low, I think, in the fall um, before rallying and closing uh, to new highs again. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if we have a similar sort of environment uh, this year. And that's based on the fact that, uh, you know, I think they're very similar conditions in terms of the acceleration off of a, of a relatively low level that we saw about a year ago and uh, in, in March of 2020. And now we're seeing a lot of conditions that are similar to late stage bull market moves. You're seeing leadership from stuff that tends to lead at the end, things like energy and financials and industrials, materials. Um, you're seeing a lot of non-confirmations or bearish divergences from momentum indicators. So if you look at the semiconductor ETF, for example, the SMH, you'll see that over the last month or so you've had higher highs in price as the price has continued higher. But the momentum, if you look at the RSI or some measure of price momentum, it's actually sloping downward. So the price is going higher, but there's less and less momentum. Similar in terms of breadth readings, if you look at the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 50-day moving average, it's actually sloping downwards over the last six weeks. So as the S&P has gone higher, less and less S&P members are actually getting back above their 50-day moving average. So all those sorts of things sort of combine for a frothy market that that's sort of at the later stages of it. And I think the way you sort of anticipate or the way you confirm that we're going to start to roll over and have a lot more downside potential is when stocks and ETFs are breaking key support levels. So something like the, the SMH, the semiconductor ETF, still, you know, I think it might have touched its 50-day moving average earlier today when everything sort of sold off uh, uh, this morning. But, you know, overall, is it able to hold its 50-day moving average? Is it able to hold its most recent swing low from January? A lot of stocks kind of have that set up. And I think if those things are able to hold, then it might not be as, as negative of a price move, and it might just be more of a time correction as we digest the recent gains from January. But I think there's a very real risk that we break some of those support levels. And I think once we do, once you find more more stocks breaking support, I think you will find a rush to the exits very quickly. And that's when a 
down to, downward move can really accelerate. So that's, I think 2021 is going to be a lot like 2010 in terms of the volatility, the choppiness, and the potential for, uh, for, for relatively violent swings. Well, my last question is what's your thoughts on uh, what's the safe haven, do you think, for 2021? Is it gold or <laughs> So that, that, is the, that is the ultimate question, right? If, if that happens with stocks and with semiconductors, all these leadership names, what do you do? And, and to be honest with you, I mean, the two things I would be looking at right now, number one, um, higher yielding stocks. So there's a reason why more the value-oriented uh, trade like financials, uh, energy uh, are doing very well. I, I think overall I, w I would expect those to continue to perform pretty well, especially on a relative basis, uh, and that's based on oil prices likely going uh, higher than where they're at now, which I think is fair. Um, the yeah. yields, uh, interest rates going higher, that's going to be good for financial stocks, and so I think those are two areas where I would be going, and, and again, some of those have, uh, have a, a greater dividend component, which can be good for uh, managing downside. Then the other thing would be precious metals. I think, you know, gold and silver have diverged a little bit recently. A lot of times they move together, but you've had a bit of a, of a differentiation between the two. Um, I think gold has had a pretty significant pullback within a longer term uptrend. And I, I think it, it's uh, with the pullback that you've seen in gold over the last, you know, three, four or five months, I think this could be a really good opportunity um, to, uh, to ride it for the next leg higher. Yeah, um, I'm expecting around three thousand dollars an ounce um, sometime later this year or early next year. But again, you know that's my perspective on it. Um, so anyway, hey Dave, I want to thank you for your information. How do people get a hold of you and StockCharts.com? Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Mark. I've I've really enjoyed our conversations and look forward to chatting with you uh, again sometime. Uh, yeah, you can you can find out more about. Stock charts at stockcharts.com. There's a free trial, a one-month free trial we always have going, and you're welcome to check it out, see how others have tried to uh, manage these markets. And, again, the, the goal with stock charts is tools, commentary, and education. So our goal is to give you a good toolkit, give you some education on how to actually use those tools, and then have expert commentary myself, John Murphy, Martin Pring, you know, some really – solid experts along with me to, to help you along the way and just let you know what we're seeing. And then we actually just released our on-demand platform, StockChartsTV.com, uh, and there's a Stock Charts app on all the app stores uh, starting this week, so I'd encourage you to check out uh, our free commentary there as well. Yeah, now, you also have a, a video show as well? Right, so I host our closing bell show on Stock Charts TV. It's called The Final Bar, so that runs every weekday. Uh, right now it runs at 6 p.m. Eastern every weekday. So just before dinner, it's a perfect way to debrief on what's happened with the markets. We look at a lot of charts. We look at short-term movements and then try to connect those to the longer-term trend. So I would encourage your listeners. I know who uh, you know, a lot are, are more short-term oriented. I would argue one of the best things you could do as a short-term trader is understand the long-term trajectories and how what you're trying to do fits into the bigger picture. Um, so, yeah, hopefully uh, your, some of your listeners could uh, benefit from that as well. Great, Dave. I want to thank you again, and this is Mark Bowers with Safe Day Trading. Talk to you later. Hey, everybody. I want to mention, too, that we have a YouTube site called Safe Day Trading, which we show you trades that we make with the techniques that we use. You can also send me questions that you might have at mark at safedaytrading.org. Anyway, talk to you later.